The Friendship of Christ by Robert Hugh Benson Forward This is my friend from an old manuscript. Let me tell you how I made his acquaintance. I had heard much of him, but took no heed. He sent daily gifts and presents, but I never thanked him. He often seemed to want my friendship, but I remained cold. I was homeless and wretched, and starving and in peril every hour, and he offered me shelter and comfort and food and safety, but I was ungrateful still. At last he crossed my path, and with tears in his eyes he besought me, saying, Come and abide with me. Let me tell you how he treats me now. He supplies all my wants. He gives me more than I dare ask. He anticipates my every need. He begs me to ask for more. He never reminds me of my past ingratitude. He never rebukes me for my past follies. Let me tell you further what I think of him. He is as good as he is great. His love is as ardent as it is true. He is as lavish of his promises as he is faithful in keeping them. He is as jealous of my love as he is deserving of it. I am in all things his debtor, but he bids me call him friend. Part 1. Christ in the Interior Soul Chapter 1. The Friendship of Christ General It is not good for man to be alone. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 The emotion of friendship is among the most mighty and the most mysterious of human instincts. Materialistic philosophers delight in tracing even the most exalted emotions, art, religion, romance, to purely carnal sources, to the instincts of the propagation or sustenation of physical life. And yet in this single experience at any rate, when we class together as we can all those varied relationships between men and men, women and women, as well as between men and women, under the common title of friendship, materialistic philosophy wholly breaks down. It is not a manifestation of sex, for David can cry to Jonathan, Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. It is not a sympathy arising from common interests, for the sage and the fool can form a friendship at least as strong as any between two sages or two fools. It is not a relationship based on the exchange of ideas, for the deepest friendships thrive better in silence than in speech. No man is truly my friend, says Maeterlinck, until we have each learned to be silent in one another's company. And this mysterious thing is as mighty as it is mysterious. It is bound to rise, so far as it is true to the laws of its own development, to a pitch of passion far beyond that of ordinary relations between the sexes. Since it is independent of those physical elements necessary to a love between husband and wife, it can rise mysteriously higher in certain respects than the plane which those elements sustain. It seeks to win nothing, to produce nothing, but to sacrifice all. Even where the supernatural motive is apparently absent, it can reflect on the natural plane even more clearly than does sacramental wedded love, the characteristics of divine charity. On its own plane, it also beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, seeketh not her own, is not puffed up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 It is the salt of perfect matrimony 
but it can exist without sex. It takes its place with those other supreme departments of human experience, art, chivalry, and even religion, and it is not the least noble of the company. On the other hand, there is hardly any experience more subject to disillusionment. It deifies beasts and is disappointed to find them human after all. When my friend fails me at a crisis, or when I fail my friend, there is hardly any bitterness in life so bitter. And again, while friendship itself has an air of eternity about it, seeming to transcend all natural limits, there is hardly any emotion so utterly at the mercy of time. We form friendships and grow out of them. It might almost be said that we cannot retain the faculty of friendship unless we are continually making new friends. Just as in religion, in proportion as we form inadequate images and ideas of the divine, which for the time we adore, and presently change for others, we progress in the knowledge of the true God. I cannot retain true childhood unless I am continually putting away childish things. Here then is one of the more princely passions which, while feeding upon earthly things, are continuously dissatisfied with them, which themselves white hot are never consumed. One of the passions that make history and therefore look always to the future and not to the past. A passion which, perhaps above all others, since in its instance it is impossible to resolve it into earthly elements, points to eternity only for the place of its satisfaction, and to the divine love for the answering of its human needs. There is but one intelligible explanation, then, for the desires which it generates, yet never fulfills. There is but one supreme friendship to which all human friendships point, one ideal friend in whom we find perfect and complete that for which we look in type and shadow in the faces of our human lovers. Number one, it is at once the privilege and the burden of Catholics that they know so much of Jesus Christ. It is their privilege, since an intelligent knowledge of the person and the attributes and the achievements of incarnate God is an infinitely greater wisdom than all the rest of the sciences put together. To have a knowledge of the Creator is incalculably a more noble thing than to have a knowledge of his creation. Yet it is a burden as well, for the splendor of this knowledge may be so great as to blind us to the value of its details. The blaze of the divinity to him who sees it may be so bright as to bewilder him with regard to the humanity. The unity of the wood vanishes in the perfection of the trees. Catholics, then, above all others, are prone, through their very knowledge of the mysteries of faith, through their very apprehension of Jesus Christ as their God, their high priest, their victim, their prophet, and their king, to forget that his delights are to be with the sons of men more than to rule the seraphim, that while his majesty held him on the throne of his father, his love brought him down on pilgrimage, that he might transform his servants into his friends. For example, devout souls often complain of their loneliness on earth. They pray, they frequent the sacraments, they do their utmost to fulfill the Christian precepts, and when all is done, they find themselves solitary. 
there could scarcely be a more evident proof of their failure to understand one at least of the great motives of the incarnation they adore christ as god they feed on him in communion cleanse themselves in his precious blood look to the time when they shall see him as their judge yet of that intimate knowledge of and companionship with him in which the divine friendship consists they have experienced little or nothing they long they say for one who can stand by their side and upon their own level who can not merely remove suffering but can himself suffer with them one to whom they can express in silence the thoughts which no speech can utter and they seem not to understand that this is the very post which jesus christ himself desires to win that the supreme longing of his sacred heart is that he should be admitted not merely to the throne of the heart or to the tribunal of conscience but to that inner secret chamber of the soul where a man is most himself and therefore most utterly alone see how full are the gospels of this desire of jesus christ there were indeed splendid moments when the god within the humanity blazed out in glory moments when the very garments that he wore burned radiant in his divinity there were moments of divine energy when blind eyes opened through creative to created light when ears deaf to earthly noises heard the divine voice, when the dead burst their graves to look on him who had first given and then restored their life. And there were august and terrible moments when God went apart with God into the wilderness or the garden, when God cried through the lips of desolated humanity, why hast thou forsaken me but for the most part it is of his humanity that the gospels tell us a humanity that cried to its kind a humanity not only tempted but also as it were specialized in all points like as we are now jesus loved martha and her sister mary and lazarus John chapter 11, verse 5. Jesus looked upon him, loved him. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Loved him, it seems, with an emotion distinguished from that of the divine love that loves all things that it has made. Loved him for the ideal which he in particular might yet accomplish more than for the fact that he merely existed as did others of his kind loved him as i love my own friend and as he loves me it is these moments probably above all others that have endeared jesus christ to humanity moments in which he displayed himself as truly one of us it is when he is lifted up not in the glory of triumphant divinity, but in the shame of beaten humanity, that he draws us to himself. We read of his works of power and are conscious of awe and adoration. But when we read how he sat weary at the well-side while his friends went for food, how in the garden he turned to agonized reproach to those from whom he had hoped for consolation. What, could you not watch one hour with me? Matthew chapter 26 verse 41. When he turned once more and for the last time used the sacred name to him who had forfeited it forever. Friend, whereto art thou come? We are conscious of that which is even dearer to him than all the adoration of all the angels in glory, tenderness and love and compassion, emotions to which friendship alone has a right. 
Or again, Jesus Christ speaks to us more than once in the Scripture, not merely in hint and implication, but in deliberate statement of this desire of His to be our friend. He sketches for us a little picture of the lonely house at nightfall, of Himself who stands and knocks upon the door, and of the intimate little meal He expects. And if any man will open, any man, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. Or again, he tells those whose hearts are sick at the bereavement that comes upon them so swiftly, I will not now call you servants, but I have called you friends. John chapter 15, verse 15. Or again, he promises his continual presence, in spite of appearances, to those who have learned his desires. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Behold, I am with you all days. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And as long as you did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. If then there is anything clear in the Gospels, it is this, that Jesus Christ first and foremost desires our friendship. It is his reproach to the world, not that the Savior came to the lost, and that the lost ran from him to lose themselves more deeply, not that the Creator came to the creature, and that the creature rejected him, but that the friend came unto his own, and that his own received him not. John chapter 1 verse 11. Now the consciousness of this friendship of Jesus Christ is the very secret of the saints. Ordinary men can live ordinary lives with little or no open defiance of God from a hundred second-rate motives. We keep the commandments that we may enter into life. We avoid sin that we may escape hell. We fight against worldliness that we may keep the respect of the world. But no man can advance three paces on the road of perfection unless Jesus Christ walks beside him. It is this, then, that gives distinction to the way of the saint and that gives him his apparent grotesqueness, too. For what is more grotesque in the eyes of the unimaginative world than the ecstasy of the lover? Common sense never yet drove a man mad. It is common sense that is thought to characterize sanity, and common sense, therefore, has never scaled mountains, much less has it cast them into the sea. But it is the maddening joy of the conscious companionship of Jesus Christ that has produced the lovers, and therefore the giants of history. It is the developing friendship of Jesus Christ and the passion that has inspired those lives, which the world in its duller moods calls unnatural, and the church in all her moods supernatural. This priest, cried St. Teresa in one of her more confidential moments with her Lord, this priest is a very proper person to be made a friend of ours. Number two, now it must be remembered that while this friendship between Christ and the soul is, from one point of view, perfectly comparable to friendship between man and man, from another point of view, it is incomparable. Certainly it is a friendship between his soul and ours, but that soul of his is united to divinity. A single individualistic friendship with him, therefore, does not exhaust his capacities. He is man, but he is not merely a man. He is the son, rather than a son of man. He is the eternal Word 
by whom all things were made and are sustained. He approaches us, therefore, along countless avenues, although it is the same figure that advances down each. It is not enough to know him interiorly only. He must be known, if his relation with us is to be that which he desires, in all those activities and manifestations in which he displays himself. One who knows him, therefore, solely as an interior companion and guide, however dear and adorable, but does not know him in the blessed sacrament, one whose heart burns as he walks with Jesus in the way, but whose eyes are held that he knows him not in the breaking of bread, knows but one perfection out of ten thousand. And again, he who calls him friend in communion, but whose devotion is so narrow and restricted that he does not recognize him in that mystical body in which he dwells and speaks on earth, one, in fact, who is a devotee, an individualist, and does not therefore understand that corporate religion which is the very essence of Catholicism. Or again, who knows him in all these ways, yet does not know him in his vicar, or in his priest, or in his mother. Or again, who knows him in all these ways, who is in popular language, an admirable Catholic, but who does not recognize the right of the sinner to ask for mercy, or the beggar for alms, in his name? Or again, who recognizes him under sensational circumstances, but not under dreary ones? Who gives lavishly to the first beggar who pleads in Christ's name in the street, but fails to find him in the unappealing dullard? Those, in short, who recognize Christ in one or two or three or more aspects, but not in all, not at least in all those of which Christ himself has explicitly spoken, can never rise to that height of intimacy and knowledge of that ideal friend which he himself desires and has declared to be within our power to attain. Let us then consider the friendship of Christ under some of these aspects. Truly we cannot live without him, for he is the life. It is impossible to come to the Father except by him who is the way. It is useless to toil in pursuit of truth unless we first possess it. Even the most sacred experiences of life are barren, unless his friendship sanctifies them. The holiest love is obscure, except it burns in his shadow. The purest affection, that affection that unites my dearest friend to myself, is a counterfeit and a usurper, unless I love my friend in Christ. Unless he, the ideal and absolute friend, is the personal bond that unites us. Chapter 2. The Friendship of Christ, Interior It is not good for man to be alone. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 It seems inconceivable at first sight that a relationship, which in any real manner can be called a friendship, should be possible between Christ and the soul. Adoration, dependence, obedience, service, and even imitation, all these things are imaginable, but until we remember that Jesus Christ took a human soul like our own, a soul liable to joy and to sorrow, open to the assaults of passion and temptation, a soul that actually did experience heaviness as well as ecstasy, the pains of obscurity as well as the joys of clear vision, until this becomes to us, from a dogmatic fact apprehended by faith, a vital fact perceived by experience, 
a full realization of his friendship is out of the question for just as in the case of ordinary persons the plane of real friendship lies in the communion of the two souls so it is between christ and a man his soul is the point of contact between his godhead and our humanity we receive his body with our lips we prostrate our whole being before his divinity but we embrace his soul with ours number one human friendships usually take their rise in some small external detail we catch a phrase we hear an inflection of a voice we notice the look of the eyes or a movement in walking and the tiny experience seems to us like an initiation into a new world we take the little event as a symbol of a universe that lies behind we think we have detected a soul exactly suited to our own a temperament which either from its resemblance to our own or from a harmonious dissimilarity is precisely fitted to be our companion then the process of friendship begins we exhibit our own characteristics we examine his in point after point we find what we expected to find and we verify our guesses and he too no less follows the same method until that point is reached as it is reached in so many cases though not thank god in all either in a crisis or after a trying period when we discover either that we have been mistaken from the beginning or that we have deceived the other or that the process has run its course the summer is come and gone and that there are no more fruits to gather on either side now the divine friendship the consciousness that is to say that christ desires our love and intimacy and offers his own in return usually begins in the same manner it may be at the reception of some sacrament such as we have received a thousand times before or it may be as we kneel before the crib at christmas or follow our lord along the way of the cross we have done these things or performed these ceremonies dutifully and lovingly again and again yet on this sudden day a new experience comes to us we understand for example for the first time that the holy child is stretching his arms from the straw not merely to embrace the world that world be little enough but to embrace our own soul in particular we understand as we watch jesus blood-stained and weary rising from his third fall that he is asking our own very self in particular to help him with his burden the glance of the divine eyes meets our own there passes from him to us an emotion or a message that we had never before associated with our own relations with him the tiny event has happened he has knocked at our door and we have opened he has called and we have answered henceforth we think he is ours and we are his here at last we tell ourselves is the friend for whom we have been looking so long here is the soul that perfectly understands our own the one personality which we can safely allow to dominate our own jesus christ has leapt forward two thousand years and is standing by our side he has come down from the painting on the wall he has risen from the straw and the manger my beloved is mine and i am his number two the friendship has begun then now begins its process 
the essence of a perfect friendship is that each friend reveals himself utterly to the other flings aside his reserves and shows himself for what he truly is the first step therefore in the divine friendship is the revelation by jesus christ of himself up to this point in our spiritual life however conscientious or dutiful that life may have been there has been a predominant element of unreality it is true that we have obeyed that we have striven to avoid sin that we have received grace forfeited it and recovered it that we have acquired merit or lost it that we have tried to do our duty endeavored to aspire and to love all this is real before god but it has not been real to ourselves we have said prayers yes but we have scarcely prayed we have meditated set the points before us reflected resolved and concluded but the watch has been laid open before us to mark our progress lest we should meditate too long but after this new and marvelous experience all is changed jesus christ begins to exhibit to us not merely the perfections of his past but the glories of his presence he begins to live before our eyes he tears from himself the conventions with which our imaginations have clothed him he lives moves speaks acts turns this way and that before our eyes he begins to reveal secret after secret hidden in his own humanity we have known facts about him all our life we have repeated the catholic creed we have assimilated all that theology can tell us now however we pass from knowledge about him to knowledge of him we begin to understand that eternal life begins in this present for it is to know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent john chapter 6 verse 3 our god is becoming our friend on the other side he demands from us what he himself offers if he strips himself before our eyes he claims that we should do the same as our god he knows every fiber of the being which he has made as our savior he knows every instant in the past in which we have swerved from his obedience but as our friend he waits for us to tell him it is tolerably true to say that the difference between our behavior respectively to an acquaintance and to a friend is that in the first case we seek to conceal ourselves to present an agreeable or a convenient image of our own character to use language as a disguise to use conversation as we might use counters and in the second case that we put aside conventions and makeshifts and seek to express ourselves as we are and not as we would have our friend to think us to be this then is required of us in the divine friendship up to now our lord has been content with very little he has accepted a tithe of our money an hour of our time a few thoughts and a few emotions paid over to him in religious intercourse and worship he has accepted those things instead of ourselves henceforth he demands that all such conventions should cease that we should be entirely open and honest with him that we should display ourselves as we really are that we should lay aside in a word all those comparatively harmless make-believes and courtesies and be utterly real 
and it is probably true to say that in practically every instance where a soul believes herself disillusioned or disappointed with the divine friendship it is not that she has actually betrayed her lord or outraged him or failed to rise to his demands in other matters but that she has never truly treated him as a friend at all. She has not been courageous enough to comply with that absolutely necessary condition of all true friendship, namely, a complete and sincere straightforwardness with him. It is far less injurious to friendship to say outright, I cannot do this thing that is asked of me, because I am a coward, and to find excellent reasons for not doing it. Number three, roughly speaking then, this is the course which the divine friendship must take. We must consider later in detail the various events and incidents that characterize it, for it is an immense consolation to remember that there is not one such incident that has not been experienced by other souls before us. The way of divine love has been trodden and retrodden already a thousand times, and it is useful, too, to reflect, before going further, that since this friendship is one between two human souls, it will follow in a great degree the regular lines of all other friendships. There are moments in it of bewildering bliss, at communion or in prayer, moments when it appears, as indeed it is, to be the one supreme experience of life, moments when the whole being is shaken and transfused with love, when the sacred heart is no longer merely an object for adoration, but a pulsating thing that beats against our own, when the bridegroom's arms are about us and his kiss on our lips. There are periods, too, of tranquility and steady warmth, of an affection at once strong and reasonable, of an esteem and an admiration satisfying to the will and the intellect, as well as to the sensitive or emotional parts of our nature. And there are periods, too, months or years, of misery and dryness, times at which it seems as if we actually needed patience with our divine friend, cases in which he appears to treat us with coldness or disdain. There will actually be moments in which it needs all the loyalty we have not to cast him off as fickle and deceptive. There will be misunderstandings, darknesses, obscurities. Yet, as time passes, and as we emerge through these crises one by one, we come more and more to verify that conviction with which we first embraced our friend. For this is indeed the one friendship in which final disappointment is impossible, and he the one friend who cannot fail. This is the one friendship for whose sake we cannot humiliate ourselves too much, cannot expose ourselves too much, cannot give too intimate confidences or offer too great sacrifices. It is in the cause of this one friend only, and of his friendship, that the words of one of his intimates are completely justified, in which he tells us that for his sake it is good to count all things to be but loss, and count them but as dung, that I may gain Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, The Purgative Way Wash me yet more from my iniquity. Psalm 50, verse 4. The initial stage of friendship formed with Jesus Christ is usually one of extraordinary happiness. For the soul has found for the first time a companion whose sympathy is perfect 
and whose presence is continuous. It is not necessarily that the soul consciously attends every instant to this new intimate, so much as that she is never wholly unconscious of him. As she goes about her ordinary business, paying to each detail of it as much attention as ever, the fact that he is present within her is never entirely forgotten. He is there as is the sunlight or the air, illuminating, freshening, and inspiring all that she experiences. From time to time she turns to him with a word or two. At times he speaks gently to her. She views all that she sees from his standpoint, or rather from her standpoint, in him. Lovely things are more lovely because of his loveliness. Painful things are less distressing because of his consolation. Nothing is indifferent because he is present. Even when she sleeps, her heart wakes to him. Yet this is only the initial stage of the process, and it is sweet largely because it is new. Certainly she has experienced a tremendous fact, yet so far she has but just entered upon it. There outstretches before her a road that ends only in the beatific vision. But there are countless stages to be passed before that end is attained. For the friendship, as so formed, is not an end in itself. Christ's desire is indeed to consummate it as soon as may be, yet it cannot be consummated by his mere desire. The soul herself must be educated, must be purified and cleansed so perfectly as to be united with him by nothing except his grace. She must be first purged and then illuminated, first stripped of herself and then adorned with his favors, before she is fit for her final union. These two stages are named by spiritual writers the way of purgation and the way of illumination, respectively. And our subject now is the way of purgation. Number one. At first, as has been said, the soul takes extraordinary pleasure in all those external things which it appears to her are sanctified by Christ's presence, and more especially by those which are most directly connected with his grace. For example, a soul that has just formed this friendship, that has perhaps either just entered the Catholic Church by conversion or has for the first time consciously and deliberately awakened to the glories of Catholicism, or even to some imperfect form of Christianity, as that system through which Christ has approached her, finds an overwhelming joy in even the most exterior details of that system. The human organization of the Church, her methods, her forms of worship, her music and her art, all these things seem to the soul as holy, heavenly, and divine. And extremely often, the first sign that the way of purgation has been really entered lies in a consciousness that there is beginning for her an experience which the world calls disillusionment. It may come in a dozen different ways. She may, for example, be brought face to face with some catastrophe in external matters. She may meet with an unworthy priest, a disunited congregation, some scandal in Christian life, in exactly that sphere where Christ seemed to her evidently supreme. She had thought that the church must be perfect because it was the church of Christ or the priesthood stainless, because it was after the order of Melchizedek. And she finds to her dismay that there is a human side even to those things that are most associated with divinity on earth. 
or it comes to her perhaps in forms of worship, the novelty begins to wear off, and the sweetness of familiarity has not yet had time to form, and she finds that those very things which had seemed to her to be the most directly connected with her new friend are in themselves external, temporary, and transitory. Her love for Christ was so great as to have gilded over all those exterior matters which he and she had in common. Now the gilding begins to wear thin, and she sees them to be but earthly after all. And the more acute her imaginative love at the beginning, the more acute her disappointment now. This, then, is usually the first stage of purgation. She becomes disillusioned with human things and finds that however Christian they may be, they are not, after all, Christ. Immediately, the first danger presents itself, for there is no cleansing process which has not within it a certain destructive power, and if she is, after all, but a superficial kind of soul, she will lose her friendship with Christ, such as it was, together with those little gifts and enticements of his with which he wooed and pleased her. There are wandering souls in the world who have failed under this test, who have mistaken human romance for an internal love, who have turned back again from Christ so soon as he has put off his ornaments. But if she be stronger than this, she will have learned her first lesson, that divinity is not in these earthly things, that the love of Christ is a deeper thing than the mere presence he makes to his new friends. Number two, the next stage of purgation lies in what may be called, in a sense, the disillusionment with divine things. The earthly side has failed her, or rather has fallen off from the reality. Now it begins to seem to her as if the divine side failed her too. A brilliant phrase of Faber well describes one element in this disillusionment, the monotony of piety. There comes a time, sooner or later, when not only do the external things of religion, music, art, liturgy, or the external things of earthly life, the companionship of friends, conversation, business relations, things which at the beginning of the divine friendship seemed radiant with Christ's love, begin to wear thin. But the very heart and essence of them begins to fail also. For example, the actual exercise of prayer becomes wearisome, the thrill of meditation, so exquisite at first, when every meditation was a looking into the eyes of Jesus, begins to cease its vibrations. The sacraments, which she had been informed work ex opere operato, confer solid grace, that is to say apart from the fervor of the soul's own action, become wearisome and monotonous and so far as she can see, do not fulfill their own promises. The very things that were intended as helps seem to become additional burdens. Or she sets her heart, let us say, on some grace or favor, some positive virtue which she knows it must be her friend's will to confer upon her. She prays, she agonizes, she strives, she pleads, and there is no voice nor any that answers. Her temptations are what they have ever been. Her human nature, she perceives, after all, is unchanged. She had thought that her newly formed friendship with Christ altered once and for all her old self, together with her relations with Him. And behold, she is the same as ever. Christ has cheated her 
it almost seems, with promises he cannot or will not fulfill. Even in those very matters in which she trusted him most, those very provinces in which he must obviously be supreme, it seems that after all he is no more to her than he had been before she knew him so intimately. Now, this stage is an infinitely more dangerous one than the preceding, for while it is comparatively easy to distinguish between Christ and, let us say, ecclesiastical music, it is not so easy to distinguish between Christ and grace, or rather between Christ and our own imaginative conceptions of what grace should be and do. There is first the danger of gradually losing hold on religion altogether, during a long lapse of discouragement, of turning with bitter reproaches upon the silent friend who will not answer. I trusted you, I believed in you, I thought I had found my lover at last, and now you too, like all the rest, have failed me. A soul such as this passes often in a burst of resentment and disappointment, either to some other religion, some modern fad that promises quick and verifiable returns in spiritual things, or to that same state in which she had been before she ever knew Christ. Only it must be remembered, a soul that has once known Christ can never be quite as one that has not known him. Or there remains one further state, more outrageous and unnatural than any, the state of a cynical and disillusioned Christian. Yes, I too, she tells some ardent soul, I too was once as you are. I too, in my youthful enthusiasm, once thought I had found the secret. But you will become practical some day too. You will understand too that romance is not truth. You will become ordinary and work a day like myself. Yes, it is all very mysterious. Perhaps, after all, experience is the only truth worth having. Yet, if all goes well, if the soul is yet strong enough still to cleave to what seems now a mere memory, if she is confident that an initiation so bewilderingly beautiful as was hers when the friendship of Christ first came to her, cannot in the long run lead to barrenness and cynicism and desolation, if she can but cry in her sincerity that it is better to kneel eternally at the grave of the buried Jesus, than to go back and mix again in the ways of the world. Then she learns at least one lesson when Jesus rises again, as he always does, that she cannot behold him in the old way, because he is not yet ascended to his Father, and that, in one word, the object of religion is that the soul should serve God, not that God should serve the soul. Number three. There follows, however, a third stage before the way of purgation is wholly passed. The soul has learned that external things are not Christ, that internal things are not Christ. She has become disillusioned, first with the frame of the picture, and next with the picture itself, before she has reached the original. She now has to learn the last lesson of all and become disillusioned with herself. Up to now she has always retained the belief, however faint and humble, that there was something in herself and of herself that attracted Christ towards her. She has been at least tempted to think that Christ had failed her. Now she has to learn that it is she who all along, in spite of her childlike love, has been failing Christ. 
and this is at once the real essence and object of purgation she has been stripped of all her coverings of her ornaments and her clothes now she has to be stripped of herself that she may be the kind of disciple that he wishes she begins then in this third stage to learn her own ignorance and her own sin and to learn too that which ought to have been wholly incompatible with her ignorance and her sin her amazing self-centeredness and complacency up to now she has thought to possess christ to hold him as a lover and a friend to grasp him and to keep him her previous mistakes came from this very thing now she has to learn that not only must she relinquish all that is not christ but she must relinquish christ leave that is to say her energetic hold on him and be content instead to be altogether held and supported by him so long as she has a shred of self left she will seek to make the friendship mutual to give at least a fraction of what she receives now she faces the fact that christ must do all that she can do nothing without him that she has no power at all except what he gives her what has been wrong with her up to now she begins to see is not so much that she has done or not done this or that that she has grasped at this or that but simply this that she has been herself all along that she has sought to possess not to be possessed that she has been herself and that that self has been hateful because it has not been altogether lost in christ she has been endeavoring to cure the symptoms of her disease but she has not touched the disease with one finger she sees for the first time that there is no good in herself apart from christ that he must be all and she nothing now if a soul has come so far as this it is extremely rare that sheer pride should be her ruin the very knowledge of herself that she has gained is an effectual cure of any further real complacency for she has seen plainly at any rate for the time being how utterly worthless she is yet there are other dangers that face her and of these one at least may be pride under the very subtle disguise of extravagant humility since i am so worthless she may be tempted to say i had better never again attempt those high flights and those aspirations after friendship with my god let me give up once and for all my dreams of perfection and my hopes of actual union with my lord i must sink back again to the common level content if i can keep myself just tolerable in his sight i must take my place again in the ordinary paths and no longer seek an intimacy with christ of which i am evidently unworthy or her self-knowledge may take the form of despair and it is a burden which before now has broken down even the mental faculties themselves i have forfeited cries a soul such as this a soul which has lost the excuse of pride but yet clings to its substance i have forfeited the friendship of christ once and for all it is impossible that i who have tasted of the heavenly gift should be renewed again unto repentance he chose me and i failed him he loved me and i have loved myself only therefore let me go far off from his presence depart from me for i am a sinful man o lord and yet if the soul only knew it now is the very moment to which all the preceding stages have led now is the very instant in which the beloved soul 
having learnt her last lesson of the purgative way, is fit to cast herself into the sea, to come to Jesus. And this she will do if she has learnt her lesson well, and is conscious that it is exactly because she is nothing in herself, and because she knows it, that Christ can be her all. No longer can pride, whether whole or wounded, keep her from him, for her pride at last is not wounded, but dead. The way of the spiritual path is strewn with the wrecks of souls that might have been friends of Christ. This one faltered because Christ put off his ornaments. This one because Christ did not allow her to think that his graces were himself. A third because wounded pride still writhed and bade her be true to her own shame rather than to his glory. All these stages and processes are known. Every spiritual writer that has ever lived has treated of them over and over again from this standpoint or from that. But the end and lesson of them all is the same, that Christ purges his friends of all that is not of him, that he leaves them nothing of themselves in order that he may be wholly theirs. For no soul can learn the strength and the love of God until she has cast her whole weight upon him. Chapter 4 The Illuminative Way Thou lightest my lamp, O Lord, O my God, enlighten my darkness. Psalm 17, verse 29 It has been seen how in the purgative way Jesus Christ, in his desire to unite the soul altogether to himself, strips her gradually of all that would hinder the perfection of that union, and brings her at last to such a denial and emptying of self, that seeing her own worthlessness, she casts at last her full weight upon him who alone can bear it. But this process is in itself little more than negative. There must follow, if the soul is to make progress, a gradual reclothing of her with the graces in which Christ desires to see her. She has put off the old man. She must now put on the new. To this stage, spiritual writers give the name of illumination and it will be convenient in treating of it to follow the same lines as those which have been followed in the treatment of the preceding stage, and to give what may be called specimen examples of the effects of grace, parallel to those by which the purgative way has been illustrated. Number one, the first stage of the purgative way it has been seen concerns things external to actual religion. The soul is gradually deepened and sifted by being taught the essential valuelessness both of them and of the emotions which they awaken. The first step of the illuminative way, then, may be said to lie by a paradox in the instruction which the soul receives as regards their value. For grace, it must be remembered, is even more paradoxical than nature. In the purgative way, the soul learns that external things cannot in themselves bear her weight, that they are worth nothing. In the illuminative way, she learns how to use them rightly, that they are worth a great deal. For example, a soul often complains that she is hindered in her progress by some apparently unnecessary trouble. The constant companionship, let us say, of some person whose temperament jars continually and inevitably with her own. Or it is some untiring temptation from which she cannot escape, some occasion of sin constantly present, a thorn in the flesh, or a warp in the mind. Or it may be that by some deprivation 
by a bereavement which withdraws all human light and strength from her life she feels herself maimed and her wings clipped in her struggles upward to god now the most elementary stage in the illuminative way consists usually in light gained from our lord whereby the soul sees the value of those external things she sees for instance that she could never gain supernatural patience or sympathy or largeness of charity unless there were present always with her some personality which demanded its exercise her natural irritation at this unavoidable companionship is a sign that she needs the exercise and the demand of constant effort at self-control and finally of actual sympathy is precisely the means by which she gains the virtue or again in the case of temptation there is humanly no other way by which certain graces can be assimilated than by their exercise no other way for example by which natural ignorance can be transformed into supernatural innocence above all no other way by which the soul can be taught to rely utterly and perseveringly upon god for it was by such constant spur as this that saint paul himself was taught as he openly confesses to understand that it is only when human weakness is most sensible of itself that divine grace is most effective or as he says perfected finally by bereavements which seem to shatter the whole life which leave the weaker character that has clung to the stronger helpless and sprawling and wounded by this means and this means only is the soul taught to adhere utterly to god the first step of the illuminative way then consists not merely in experiencing these things for temptations and bereavements are common to souls in all stages of the spiritual life but in perceiving their value intellectually and interiorly so clearly and unmistakably that never again if the soul continues in her course can she resent or rebel against such things except perhaps in momentary lapses but that rather understanding their value she bends all her will to accept them and use them as god wills and it is therefore exactly at this stage that the soul ceases to be bewildered by the problem of pain for while she cannot of course intellectually solve the problem she answers it in the only way in which it is possible by grasping pain or at any rate acquiescing in it she now sees it practically to be reasonable and henceforth endeavors to act upon that intuition number two the second step of the illuminative way corresponding to that of the purgative consists in light being gained from god as to the reality of interior things for instance the truths of religion for example a soul in the elementary stage of faith adheres to an enormous number of dogmas of which she has no interior experience at all she adheres to them and lives by them for the simple fact that she receives them from an authority which she knows to be divine but not only can she not intellectually understand many of them but she has not what the scriptures call any spiritual discernment with regard to them she has received the faith as our lord tells us we must all receive it as a little child she holds the casket of the creed tightly in her hands guides her life by its light would die sooner than part with it and ultimately sanctifies and saves her soul by her simple faithfulness towards it 
but she has never dreamed of opening it. Or if she has opened it, all, or at least much within, is dark to her. Such a soul as this, for instance, wins indulgences by fulfilling the necessary conditions, and can perhaps even give the orthodox theological account of what an indulgence actually is. But the spiritual transaction is as impenetrable to her eyes as a jewel in a locked box. Or it may be the doctrine of eternal punishment, or the prerogatives of Mary, or the real presence. She adheres to these things, and lives according to their effects and consequences, but they have no glimmer of light within them so far as she is concerned. She walks wholly by faith and not at all by verification. She holds the dogmas of faith, but cannot compare them in any sense to natural facts or see those numerous points at which they fit into other facts of her experience. But when illumination comes, an extraordinary change takes place. It is not that mysteries cease to be mysteries, not that she can express an exhaustive human language, or even conceive in exhaustive images or modes those facts of revelation that are beyond reason. But for all that, there begins to shine to her spiritual sense lighted by God's candle within her soul, point after point in those jewels of truth which up to now have been opaque and colorless. She can explain indulgences or the justice of hell no better than before, and yet there is no longer impenetrable darkness within them. She begins to handle what she has already only touched, to comprehend what she has handled. She finds, by a certain inexplicable process of spiritual verification, that those things which she has taken to be true are true to her as well as in themselves. The path where she has walked in darkness, though in security, becomes dimly apparent to her eyes until if she, by grace and perseverance, ultimately reaches sanctity itself, she may experience by God's favor those clear-sighted intuitions, or rather that infusion of knowledge, which is so marked a characteristic in the saints. Number three, the third stage of illumination, corresponding with that of the purgative way, deals with those actual relations between Christ and the soul that are involved in the divine friendship. Now, we saw that the last step of the purgative way was that abandonment of self into Christ's arms that is only possible when the soul has no longer any self-reliance. The corresponding step of the illuminative way is therefore the accession of light which the soul receives as to the abiding presence of Christ within her, or perhaps it is safer to say, of her abiding presence within Christ. It is at this point, therefore, that the divine friendship becomes the object of actual intelligence and contemplation. It is henceforth not only enjoyed, but in a certain degree, consciously perceived and understood. This is nothing else than ordinary contemplation. Extraordinary contemplation, with its supernatural and miraculous graces and manifestations, is a favor bestowed by God motu proprio. It is something for which it is practically always presumption to pray, a state which, in its earlier stages, is always to be regarded with self-distrust. This, then, is not our affair at all. But ordinary contemplation is not only a state to be prayed for, 
but a state to which every sincere and devout Christian is bound to aspire, since it is perfectly within his reach by the help of ordinary graces. It consists in a consciousness of God so effective and so continuous that God is never wholly absent from the thoughts, at least subconsciously. It is a state which, as has been said, the soul, when first initiated into the friendship of Christ, in the beginning enjoys with extreme though fitful intensity. Life is changed by it. All relations are altered by it. Christ begins to be indeed the light that irradiates every object of the soul's attention. He becomes the background or the medium by whose help all things are seen. Ordinary contemplation, then, is the fixing of this state by effort as well as by grace. Until the soul has been purged, and until further it has been illuminated as to both exterior and interior things, the consciousness of Christ's interior presence cannot be a continuous state. But when these processes have taken place, when Christ, that is, has trained his new friend in the duties and rewards of the divine companionship, ordinary contemplation is, if we may say so, the attention that he expects from her. Sin, of course, in this state, becomes subjectively far more grave. Material sins easily become formal. But on the other hand, virtue is far easier, since it is difficult for any soul to sin very outrageously so long as she feels the pressure of Christ's hand in hers. Number four. Of course, since every advance in spiritual life has its corresponding dangers, since every step that we rise nearer to God increases the depth of the gulf into which we may fall, a soul that has reached the stage of the illuminative way, which we have called ordinary contemplation, and which is, in fact, the point at which the state of union is reached, has an enormous increase of responsibility. The supreme danger is that of individualism, by which the soul that has climbed up from ordinary pride reaches the zone in which genuine spiritual pride is encountered, and with spiritual pride, every other form of pride, such as intellectual or emotional pride, which belong to the interior state. For there is something extraordinarily intoxicating and elevating in the attaining of a point where the soul can say with truth, Thou lightest my lamp, O Lord. Psalm 17, verse 29. It is bound, in fact, to end in pride, unless she can finish the quotation and add, O my God, enlighten my darkness. Every heresy and every sect that has ever rent the unity of the body of Christ has taken its rise primarily in the illuminated soul of this or that chosen friend of Christ. Practically all the really great heresiarchs have enjoyed a high degree of interior knowledge, or they could have led none of Christ's simple friends astray. What is absolutely needed, then, if illumination is not to end in disunion and destruction, is that, coupled with this increase of interior spiritual life, there should go with it an increase of devotion and submission to the exterior voice with which God speaks in His Church. For notoriously, nothing is so difficult to discern as the difference between the inspirations of the Holy Ghost and the inspirations or imaginations of self. For non-Catholics, it is almost impossible to avoid this elevation of self, this reliance upon interior experience. 
those elements in fact which still keep protestantism in being and still endlessly subdivide its energies for they are aware of no such exterior voice by which their own experiences may be tested but it is possible too as our own days show for even educated and intelligent catholics to suffer from this disease of esotericism to imagine that the exterior must be avoided by the interior and that they are better able to interpret the church than is the church to interpret herself vi soli woe to him that is alone woe to him who having received the friendship of christ and its consequent illumination believes that he enjoys in its interpretation an infallibility which he denies to christ's outwardly commissioned vicar for the stronger the interior life and the higher the degree of illumination the more is the strong hand of the church needed and the higher ought to be the soul's appreciation of her office it is we are bound to remind ourselves from the inner circle of christ's intimates that those who know his secrets and have been taught how to find the gate of the inner garden where he walks at his ease with his own that the judases of history are drawn chapter five christ in the eucharist i am the bread of life john chapter six verse thirty five up to the present we have considered the interior friendship of christ with the soul a friendship it must be remembered that is open not to catholics only but to all who know the name of jesus and indeed in a sense to every human being for our lord is the light that enlighteneth every man john chapter 1 verse 9 it is his voice that speaks through conscience however faulty that instrument may be it is he since he is the only absolute who is the dim ideal figure discerned standing in the gloom of all hearts who desire him it is he whom marcus aurelius and gaudama and confucius and mohammed with all their sincere disciples so far as they were true to themselves desired even though they never heard his historical name of jesus or having heard it rejected him so far as that rejection was without their own fault this then is the explanation of non-catholic and even of non-christian piety it would be terrible if it were not so for in that case we could not claim that our saviour could be in any real sense the saviour of the world but that christ whom we catholics know to be incarnate and to have lived the life recorded of him in the gospels has always lived an interior life in the human heart an old hindu it is related after hearing one sermon on the life of christ begged for baptism but how can you ask for it so soon inquired the preacher have you ever heard the name of jesus before today no said the old man but i have known him and have been seeking him all my life long it was partly in order to convince men of the true nature of sins against conscience men who knew not what they did that christ was incarnate and suffered the death of the cross this he says in effect is what you have done to me interiorly all your lives we pass now to consider another avenue along which christ approaches us and seeks our friendship another mode and indeed other gifts which he conveys to us it is not enough to know christ in one manner only we are bound if we desire to know him on his own terms and not on ours 
to recognize him under every form which he chooses to use it is not enough to say interiorly he is my friend therefore i need nothing else it is not loyal friendship to repudiate for example the church or the sacraments as unnecessary without first inquiring whether or no he has instituted these things as ways through which he designs to approach us and particularly we must remember in the blessed sacrament he actually conveys to us gifts which we cannot otherwise claim he brings near to us and unites to us not only his divinity but that same dear and adorable human nature which he assumed on earth for this very purpose as we look back over history the first thought that occurs to us with regard to the blessed sacrament is that of the majesty in which christ has manifested himself how he has used his sacramental presence that is to say to assert openly and vividly his royal sovereignty in this world those who have seen earthly monarchs following bareheaded jesus christ in the eucharist those who were present even in our own day at those tremendous scenes when in london for example christ blessed his people from the balcony of the catholic cathedral or in montreal was lifted up in the open air for the adoration of a hundred thousand persons those who have ever witnessed even on the smallest scale perhaps in some italian village a procession of corpus christi have seen the outward emblems not only due to divinity but to an earthly sovereignty openly displayed cannot help marveling at the manner in which under his own guidance that sacrament which was instituted under the poorest possible outward conditions in a mean little upper room before the eyes of a few uneducated men has come to be the means by which not only his humility and condescension but his inherent majesty is made visible to the world whether for that world's adoration or its hostility this however is not our subject we are thinking rather of the amazing manner in which christ in his sacrament approaches us along our own level of matter and sense and in terms that are unmistakable by those who approach him in simplicity offers us his friendship number one explicit devotion to the dweller in the tabernacle is as we know of comparatively late development yet it is a development as inevitably certain and therefore as divinely intended as the earthly splendor which has gradually gathered round that sacrament and as the dogmatic conclusions which though not explicitly worked out in the earliest centuries are yet irrefutably contained in christ's own words and were present implicitly to the minds of his earliest friends in fact in this as in many other points the eucharistic life of jesus offers a marvelously suggestive parallel to his natural life lived on earth he who was all wisdom and all power advanced in wisdom and age gradually manifested that is the characteristics of divinity life and knowledge inherently present in his personality at the beginning he who worked in the carpenter's shop was for all that god from the beginning so in his eucharistic life that sacrament of which the whole elaborate catholic doctrine of today has been always true gradually increased its own expression gradually unfolded that which it had always been jesus christ then dwells in our tabernacles today 
as surely as he dwelt in Nazareth, and in the very same human nature. And he dwells there largely for this very purpose, that he may make himself accessible to all who know him interiorly and desire to know him more perfectly. It is this presence which causes that astounding difference of atmosphere, confessed even by non-Catholics, between Catholic churches and all others. So marked is this difference that a thousand explanations have to be framed to account for it. It is the suggestiveness of the single point of light burning there. It is the preternatural artistic skill with which the churches are ordered. It is the smell of ancient incense. It is anything and everything except that which we Catholics know it to be, the actual bodily presence of the fairest of the children of men, drawing his friends to himself. Before this strange presence, the bride of yesterday presents the new life now opening before her. The dead man of tomorrow offers the life that is past. The mourners are the happy, the philosopher and the fool, the old man and the child, persons of every temperament, every range of intellect, every nationality. All these unite in that which alone can unite them, the friendship of the lover of their souls. Could there be anything more characteristic of the Jesus of the Gospels than this accessibility of his, by which he stands waiting for all who desire to come to him, this undiscriminating tenderness to those, not one of whom will he cast out? Could there be anything more characteristic of the Christ who dwells in the heart than that he who is so simple interiorly should lie also in the realm without, desiring us to acknowledge him not only in ourselves, but outside ourselves, not only in interior consciousness, but also in a sense in that very realm of space and time which so often seems to obscure his presence in the world. It is in this manner, then, that he fulfills that essential of true friendship, which we call humility. He places himself at the mercy of the world whom he desires to win for himself. He offers himself there in a poorer disguise even than in the days of his flesh, Yet by the faith and teaching of his church, by the ceremonies with which she greets his presence, and by the recognition by his friends, he indicates to those who long to recognize him and who love him, and though they may not know it, that it is he himself who is there, the desire of all nations and the lover of every soul. Number two, yet he does not enter the tabernacle direct. He first becomes present on the altar at the word of his priest in the form of a victim. In the sacrifice of the mass, he presents himself before the world as well as before the eyes of the eternal father in the same significance as that in which he hung upon the cross performing the same act which he did once for all, the same act by which he displayed that passion of friendship in whose name he claims our hearts, the climax of that greatest love of all by which he laid down his life for his friends. This, of course, an unthinkable conception to those who know little or nothing of the living Jesus whose whole knowledge of him lies, as they openly admit, within the covers of a printed book. To such as these the sacrifice is finished and closed in the same manner in which a book itself can be finished, closed, and done with, living only hereafter in the effect of its energy. 
even to those who know more of Jesus than this, who recognize him as living a real interior life within their own hearts, even to men of real inward spirituality, the doctrine of the continual sacrifice of the Mass sometimes seems derogatory to the perfection of Calvary. Yet to the Catholic who enjoys the friendship of Christ, this sacrifice follows, I might almost say inevitably, from his knowledge of Jesus as yesterday and today and the same forever. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 To him that finishing on the cross is a new beginning. It is that first supreme and inaugural act in which all sacrifices are summed up and which, in its turn, projects itself into all the future presentations of itself, in such a sense that Christ remains always that which he was on Calvary, the eternal victim of this and every altar, through whom alone we have access to the Father. The tabernacle, then, presents Christ to us as friend, the altar presents him performing before our eyes that eternal act by which he wins in his humanity the right to demand our friendship. Number three, and yet there is one last step of humiliation, even deeper, down which he comes to us. That step by which our victim and our friend descends to be our food. For so great is his love to us that it is not enough for him to remain as an object of adoration, not enough for him to lie there as our sin-bearer, not enough above all for him to dwell within our souls in an interior friendship in a mode apprehensible only to illuminated eyes. But in communion, he hurries down that very stairway of sense up which we so often seek to climb in vain. While we are yet a great way off, he runs to meet us, and there, flinging aside those poor signs of royalty with which we strive to honor him, leaving there the embroidery and the flowers and the lights, he not merely unites himself to us, soul to soul, in the intimacy of prayer, but body to body, in the sensible form of his sacramental life. This, then, is the last and greatest sign that he could give in this manner. This is, after all, what Jesus must do. He who sat at meat with the sinners gives himself to be their meat. He at whose table we desire to stand as servants comes forth himself to serve us. He who lives secretly within the heart, yet who was incarnate before men's eyes, once more repeats that crowning act of love and presents himself under visible appearances to those eyes that desire to see him. If humility is the essential of friendship, here surely is the supreme friend. And those who do not know him in the breaking of bread, however great may be their interior knowledge of him, cannot know one tithe of his perfections. If he merely lived in heaven, in his human nature, at the right hand of the majesty on high, he would not be the Christ of the Gospels. If he merely lived in his divine nature in the hearts of those who received him and made him welcome, he would not be the Christ of Capernaum and Jerusalem. But that he, the creator of the world, who made himself once to be in the form of a creature, that he, who dwelling in inaccessible light, descended to our lower darkness, that this God of ours, who so passionately desired the friendship of the sons of men 
as to make himself in their image and likeness. That Jesus Christ of the gospel and the interior life, who rising again from the dead, dieth now no more, who has taken up our human nature to that glory from which that same human nature once brought him down, that he who is above all laws should use those laws to his own purposes and present himself not once but ten thousand times as our victim, not once but ten thousand times as our food, and not once and no more but eternally and unchangeably our friend. This is indeed the Jesus whom we have known in the Gospels and in our own hearts, our friend by every right and every claim. Learn then something of his own humility before the sacrament which is himself. As he strips from himself that glory which is his, we must strip from ourselves the pride to which we have no right. Every rag and shred of that complacency and self-centeredness that are the greatest of all obstacles to the designs of his love. We must humble ourselves in the very dust before those divine and gracious feet, which not only in Jerusalem two thousand years ago, but today, and in these cities in which we live, travel so far to seek and save our souls.